district and the students and staff of Whitehall High School, welcome to our Veterans Day program for 2013. Uh, we thank you all for taking time and being with us today, and I know we take a great amount of pride in providing a, a program that we think is an enjoyment to watch. Without further ado, we'll turn it over to Legion Commander Kim Easy as we get things started. Morning. Welcome to our 2013 Veterans Day program. For 95 years, people have been gathering to observe and honor this day. At this time, I'd like the uh, flag detail to advance the colors. Please rise. I'll ask the uh, Badger Girl State representatives and Badger Boy State representatives to, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. This is going to be our national anthem, so please, please rise.
On February 3, 1943, the SS Dorchester, an American troop transport vessel, sank in the icy waters off the coast of Greenland, the victim of a German U boat. Of the 904 men aboard, 605 were lost. Among those who perished were four army chaplains, each of a different faith, each called to the same duty. The testimony of the survivors tells the story best. As the overcrowded lifeboats capsized, as rafts drifted away empty, and men milled around on deck on the ragged edge of panic, the only fragment of hope came from these four men. And when the life jackets were gone, they gave away their own. As the survivors swam away, they remember the chaplain standing, their arms linked, and braced against the slanting deck. They were praying, words of prayer in Latin, Hebrew, and English, addressed to the same God.
Thank you. This morning we're honored to have with us a young lady that I think it, uh, a lot of you people are familiar with. This uh, young lady graduated from Whitehall High School and she went on to serve in the U.S. Army for approximately 10 years, I believe. And uh, she's going to be our speaker here this morning and I'd like to introduce Kim Shepard Lennon. Please forgive me. <laughs> um, when you think of veteran, I'm curious what comes to mind. I think of an older man with a blue baseball cap with maybe some Navy battleship written on it. And that's what I think of when a veteran comes to mind. Um, maybe some of you, it's a Vietnam warrior running through the jungle with the M16 or the younger man sitting in the Humvee in the middle of the desert. Um, but then I thought, as a woman, how come I never think of a woman when I hear the word veteran? Why doesn't that ever pop up in my head? So that's why, how I came up with the topic of women warriors today. And I'm really nervous, so bear with me. Um, Women have always been part of battles, and the earliest female I could find in a written history is Queen Vesalia, Vesalia and that's not her picture, there are no pictures. Um, she was in battle, and she lost her leg. They replaced her leg with an iron prosthesis, and it's the first documentation of an actual um, artificial limb. And being that it was iron, I don't know how effective it was when she did return to battle, but um, this is the earliest written record of a female warrior. And then the second one that I found was Queen Zenobia of Syria, and she led the army into a battle against Egypt, and they conquered Egypt. She was a distant relative of um, Cleopatra. And then Queen Boudicca of Britain led a revolt against the Romans. That's all I got over. Joan of Arc defeated the English. And then a little closer to home is Dr. Mary Walker from the Civil War. She was the first woman to ever receive the Medal of Honor, and as to date, she's still the only one. Um, she was imprisoned by the Confederates for being a spy, and she was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor in 1865. Um, later, the government revoked it, but she refused to give it back. Um, but later, President Carver restored her medal. She was also an Army surgeon. She worked as an Army surgeon during the Civil War. She wasn't fond of wearing dresses. She wore pants a lot. Um, so she was pretty revolutionary for her time. And then, what defines a warrior? Is it someone that only sees battle? Um, there's different battles. You know, there's physical fighting, but there's also fighting for something you believe in, or maybe some rights that you're denied. And so that's kind of where I'd like to head into next, is different types of women warriors. Um, I guess I would kind of put myself into the category of a woman warrior. I, after, well first, when I joined the Army, um, I faced a lot of discrimination, harassment, not only for being really short, but also a female. The short jokes I could handle because I was used to them. Um, but 
being a female and getting a lot of harassment for it is a little different. The first instance I could really remember was basic training. And I had cut my hair really short, so I didn't have to deal with it, because otherwise the drill sergeants are yelling at you, you know, get your hair off your collar. Um, so I got it cut, and we were standing in line at the chow hall, getting, uh, we had just finished a road march, and it was really hot. We had Cavaliers on, so we weren't ready for a fashion show or anything. And an old sergeant major pulled me out of the line and told me I needed to grow my hair long and I needed to look more feminine, um, and I really didn't know what to say, except, you know, you have to say, yes, start made or whatever. Um, can't tell you what I said afterwards, but um, after my buddies found out, they all went and got their hair, hair cut short, too, so, you know, we just kind of, you know, we're going to cut our hair, and it's a lot easier. And we're soldiers, so why should we, you know, why is it any different? Um, the first unit I went to was a forward support battalion. And there were a lot of females there. So it wasn't a lot of discrimination, but a lot of harassment. Um, and you learn to deal with it. You give it back, so to speak. And... Um, I really don't have any interesting stories or anything with um, my first unit. It was just a lot of hard work and I was really glad to leave it. Um, so after leaving Germany, I went to Fort Carson and I was the second female to be in the 4th Combat Engineers in the battalion. Um, and so there was two of us and then a battalion full of guys. I had to go stay in the barracks when I first arrived, and the men there weren't too happy because I was the only female, and, you know, then they had to kind of pay attention to what they were doing and uh, everything, so they weren't happy about it. They tried a lot of different things to get me out of the barracks. Um, you know, I got accused of playing my music too loud. Um, smoking pot was one of them, so I had to go get drug tested, and they found nothing. Um, just pretty much anything they could think of to get me out of there they came up with, but, um, you know, I did what I was supposed to do, and eventually I did leave into, um, housing, but, um, in the motor pool, like I said, there was just two of us, and, um, engineers is a lot of, like, construction equipment. And so you don't get to deal with the equipment. What I did is order parts and um, just make sure they had everything they needed for their vehicles. Um, and it was a lot of hard work. We go to the field a lot, being the only female in the motor pool, in the going out to the field, there were no bathrooms. Um, and I remember asking our motor pool officer, you know, when we were going to get a porta potty or something, and he just handed me a paper cup. And so after a couple days of that, then they finally got a porta potty, and you know, it was a little better. But after a while, you just, you know, you get used to being the only female, and you become one of the guys, and they get used to you being there, and. When they see that, you know, she does her job, she can hang with us, she can run, she beats us half the time. Um, you know, then it's, you're one big family. And there really isn't any words to describe the emotions that you share with um, the people that you work with in the military. So after I left Fort Carson, I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And that's not me. <laughs> you go to the next one. There we go. Um, I went to 2-4 Field Artillery, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And when I heard I was going to Oklahoma, a field artillery post, I was excited because I thought I was going to get some easy job and a little warehouse because women aren't in field artillery. And I was really wrong. Um, 
I guess they decided, since I had been in an all-male unit, that I could be the first female to be in this male unit. And so they sent me to 2-4. Um, it's the largest combat, at the time it was the largest combat arms. Um, and there's a difference between being attached and assigned to a unit. Women couldn't be assigned to field artillery, so I was just attached. It's just a technical term. I did everything they did. Um, it's just women weren't allowed to be assigned to combat arms. Um, so what equipment that I supported was the MLRS, and it's a type of rocket launcher. Um, I was a junior NCO, and the spot that I had to fill was for a, a male senior NCO, and so a lot of them weren't really happy with that. My first day there, you meet your sergeant major, and he really wasn't thrilled with having a female NCO in his motor pool. And I sat in front of his office for about two hours waiting to meet him, and I could hear him in the office kind of yelling at the brigade sergeant major, you know, how come he's got this female? Um, he obviously lost that battle. And so when I went in to meet him, um, all I heard was how hard it was going to be. You know, in the field, there's no bathrooms, there's no showers. Um, he's not going to take me in to get a shower, or it was just really um, disheartening. But I don't think, I think I've pretty much seen everything in the combat engineers that. Nothing here would surprise me, so I stuck with it. Um, and the job I had was, uh, it was a PLL TAM sergeant, and it's just supply, um, and, or like the automated logistical specialist. With the field artillery, we went to the field a lot. Um, I had to, you know, go with the shower, no showers, um, same with the bathroom. Uh, there was one bathroom in the motor pool, and the sign on, you know, you flip the sign, but even if it said women, guys would still walk in. Um, or they wouldn't change it back to men, so I'd walk in. Um, but towards the end, it... You know, it, like I said before, you become a family. You show that you can do the job sometimes better than people that were there before. And they did start getting more and more women into that unit. And when I left, there was probably maybe a dozen of us there. And so researching for this, um, I found that 2-4 is the first unit that accepted female um, actual artillery, they are in the MLRS, they're driving, um, they're loading it, they're doing everything that the men, that we weren't allowed to do when I was there. So, in a way, I kind of think that by being there, first we kind of paved the path for the rest of them, and um, so I hope that, you know, it continues that way. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> um, that's really all I have. I just want to say that if any of you females join the military, don't be afraid to be the first to do something. Be the leader, you know, set the course for the women behind you and make it better for them. Kim, I might add that she is a member of our Legion Post 191, and we're very proud to have her as a member. I'll we'll call on the, we have a vocal, vocal selection by a vocal group uh, at this time.
under the direction of Krista Chose. Welcome to, to, to Veterans Day 2013. In keeping with our tradition, the Preserving History class has created a presentation based on our local research. Our theme this year is World War II. Because of the immense scope of this war, it is impossible to do justice in this brief program today. This truly was a world war, modern, mechanized, and fierce. This is only a snapshot of this brief, of this difficult time. In the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor on 7 December 1941 and the onset of American involvement in World War II, Whitehall, Pigeon Falls, Pleasantville, Northfield, York, and the surrounding areas would step up and play a key role in the war effort overseas and right here at home. Hundreds of men from Treple County would answer the call of duty, either volunteering or being drafted into the United States Armed Forces.
Our young men would be sent to the far reaches of the globe. They would send back letters from little known places like Tarawa, Saipan, Okinawa, Midway, and the Aleutian Islands. While other young men were sent to other destinations in England, Africa, Italy, and France. Women played a vital role in support units of the WAX, the WAVES, and the Nurse Corps.
On the home front, everyone did their part. The women in the community spent many hours on the war effort, volunteering for anything from bandage making to Red Cross work. The area dairy farms supplied the local Land Lakes plant with milk and eggs. In one of the greatest triumphs of the dairy industry, the Land Lakes plant in Whitehall was the first dry milk plant in the country to receive the Army Navy E Award for production. When American soldiers were liberated from German prison camps, they were extremely malnourished. 92,000 American soldiers were treated with a diet of Land Lakes powdered milk and eggs. Approximately 16 million American men and women served in the armed forces of the United States of America during World War II. The United States would suffer over a million casualties during the war. These young men would come from bridge tops and valleys, small towns and villages that we still call home today. Our families would grieve, our boys would not come back on ski. One of Treble County's first casualties was Sergeant Harold Stendhal, who died on 7 September 1942. Hutchinson Stendhal, American Legion Post 191, is named after him. Today, Amy Stendhal, Harold's great niece, will read the letter of her great grandmother, Ella Stendhal, received from the War Department upon Harold's death. War Department, Office of Chief of Staff, Washington, September 22, 1942. Mrs. Ella Stendhal, Whitehall, Wisconsin. Dear Mrs. Stendhal, words can be of little consolation at this time of sadness, but I want you to know that you have my heartfelt sympathy in the loss of your son. Harold Stendhal has made the great contribution to the American way of living. He was a soldier who died in the line of duty, and his sacrifice will not be forgotten by those who are determined to bring this terrible struggle to a victorious conclusion. Again, my deepest sympathy. Faithfully yours, G.C. Marshall, Chief of Staff. Scenes like this were played out throughout the towns of Trempeau County and coolies of this land. Memorial services would be held in places like Our Savior's Lutheran Church, just down the street from where we gather today. On Sunday, June 24, 1945, one such service was honored, was held honoring three young white old men who were killed in action. Private First Class Ernest M. Moan at Normandy, Technical Sergeant o. B. Omer B. Olson, in Germany, and Lieutenant Raymond B. Larson in the Pacific. Today, we recreate a part of this service. A vocal duet, I Will Lift Up Mine Eyes, was sung by Mr. and Mrs. Philip Tomte. Performing this song is Rita Hagee and Sarah Torson, wife and daughter of World War II veteran Tom Hagee.
servant entitled, Greater Love Hath No Man, John 15, 13, was given by Pastor O.G. Berkman, Department Chaplain of the American Legion. America the Beautiful was sung by the male quartet consisting of H.J. Allison, Orrin Evenson, Harlan Schaefer, and Philip Tompte. Singing this song today is Carter Sem, Tristan Powell, Jackson Standifer, and Daniel Wall. Sacrifice laid down 
by our World War II era veterans share a common tie with the fallen of every war and every era. Today, we thank each and every veteran for their service to our country. Thank you. music selections um, by the high school choir under the direction of Krista Chose.
we invite any of those who would like to join us in the Nation's Creed up?
Can we please have all auxiliary members stand to be recognized? the uh, construction here that is in this uh, school is this year, we will not be having the rifle salute. So at, uh, uh, at this time, we'll be having the sounding of taps by Carter Sim and, and Peyton Slobby. Thank you. Please remain standing as, as the uh, uh, flag detail come forward and retire the colors, please. Please be seated. This uh, concludes our Veterans Day program this morning, and, and uh, you have been a very, very attentive audience, and we appreciate the uh, the uh, Whitehall High School for uh, helping us out in this program, and and, and the uh, particular the history class for uh, having this tribute to the veterans this morning. So this concludes our part of the program. According to the program here, we'll have a uh, um, sing-along, God Bless America, and be led by Jackson Stanford, Carter Sam, and Sierra Dubiel. Will they please come forward?
Please be seated. Thank you for your attendance this morning. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Bigley. Thank you again, all of you, for, for attending our 2013 Veterans Day program. As you can tell, we take a great deal of pride in this day, and, and I think uh, I would like to compliment our students on your behavior today. It's been tremendous. Thank you very much. Uh, what we will do as middle school folks, we'd like to have you go out the back. You can go to lunch. Thank you. High school folks, you may enter or exit out the main room door here and head to class. Fifth hour class. Thank you.